Okay, I'm going to start the question by, I mean, I'm going to start the presentation by the question of why build tall. And I want to start with a little bit of brief history. Uh, going back to 1993 in Shanghai, China. Uh, and what you see in this image, that green area, is called the Pudong District in 1993. Not, not that long ago. Uh, but the Lajotsui District had developed a series of master plans. They put these master plans together and uh, uh, a little bit before then, Deng Xiaoping said that to rich is to be glorious and uh, that the new financial district for China shall be here. So that was the start of uh, the tall building uh, syndrome in China. And it's interesting to see what has happened. Uh, this building is called the Jinmao Tower, which I did while at SLM. Uh, and this became China's tallest building for a while and the third tallest building in the world when it was completed in uh, 1998. And you can see by that time, uh, several 30 and 40 story buildings had already cropped up, um, beginning to give focus to that neighborhood. And I think one of the key issues here is uh, that the real role for Jin Mao was to establish this neighborhood as a, as a center for finance in China. And as such, it had to be uh, a landmark building identifiable by the Chinese as a landmark status. And it had to give comfort and uh, a degree of surety to the developer, to the development community that was uh, to be building buildings around it that this would indeed be a, a true focal point and a financial district. So that confidence was very important. And I think we uh, have begun to achieve it. Here is Shanghai in 2011, where uh, it has already been eclipsed by a couple projects. And here in 2015, you can hardly see Jin Mao. So, uh, the strategy, at least uh, from China's point of view, seemed to work very well indeed in terms of establishing, establishing Pudong as a major city center, a major world center of capital, uh, of, uh, capital and finance. Going to Dubai. At Dubai, this is uh, Dubai in 1993. Interesting, the similar time frame. Shanghai in 1993, Dubai in 1993. Um, this was uh, the Sheikh Syed Road, and uh, there is a city behind us on this photograph, but uh, it's a smaller version of a city. Um, and Dubai came out with an important structure, which certainly placed Dubai on the map in terms of uh, people understanding where Dubai was. This building was highly publicized, and um, it became an important uh, symbol for Dubai in establishing Dubai as a potential global global uh, destination. But because there was no land around it, there really couldn't be any development around it. So it didn't add value in and of itself to uh, the surrounding context that could basically only be done by a governmental agency in this case. Uh, because uh, to build these tall buildings is very expensive. Um, we were hired, while I was at SOM, we were hired to do the uh, Burj Khalifa. And the Burj Khalifa was uh, to be the center of a district which had, at that point in time, been a, a, a neglected and uh, abandoned Navy base. Um, so it was, there was nothing around Burj Khalifa and nothing to the uh, west of Burj Khalifa for roughly 10 miles until you begin to get to the marina district which had just been started and two or three 40-story structures were under construction there. So the only thing really that between the two uh, was the Burj Al Arab that I just showed you. But uh, the 
uh, Burj Khalifa uh, was in many respects very successful as a development strategy where Imar Properties uh, was able to obtain roughly 300 acres around the Burj and they master planned these acres uh, for something in the neighborhood of 60 properties, um, 60 major properties. Started building the uh, one, two, and three story structures uh, before Burj started, but while it was being planned, and then started marketing the mid rise 30, 40 story buildings uh, as individual sites. And uh, I believe they kept almost all of these sites, uh, and rent these were mostly rental and condo buildings uh, that you see here. They then built the 80-story uh, uh, address hotel, which in this picture is right, at, right there. So you can see the scale of some of these things. Um, and today, uh, it sits there with uh, buildings that are approaching 100 stories in height. Uh, it is the center of uh, the Burj Dubai downtown area, which is still a vibrant uh, community and growing uh, still today, uh, creating buildings. We did a design for a building there that was a 70-story residential building in 2007. It's just now started <laughs> construction. So. Uh, it's interesting, but this building has, has, the fundamental purpose of this building was to make money for the developer on all of the adjacent lands. Um, ironically, this building has made some money on its own because of the spectacular um, sky lobby at the 123rd floor and later to the 149th floor. Um, and my understanding is that it has it has income of roughly $125 million per year just for that one floor. So it's quite, quite interesting as a side note, and you'll see how we've taken advantage of that in other places. Uh, moving a little bit to New York City in 1873, it was all, looks like it was mostly low rise at that time. Of course, the elevator uh, was at its infancy and uh, uh, so people knew that New York City was a great place to be. And that, um, so um, oh, there's quite a change between, uh, guys? you know, 18, the 1800s and 1932 at the, uh, at the beginning of the Depression. Uh, here is uh, New York City. And, and probably one of the first major clusters of super tall buildings or, or tall, very tall buildings uh, that existed in the world. Um, and uh, became, it becomes a prototype for what we're doing now in many other cities, actually. Um, and <laughs> it, they looked tall before, but now they look short at, up against uh, World Trade Center. And uh, so maybe in the future, there will be more buildings that break that height barrier and uh, create more of a cone at the, at the 1,100 foot high range. So can a single project impact and extend beyond a city to a country and beyond? Uh, this is the Kingdom Tower that we have designed for the Jedi Economic Company, and uh, which is now under construction and has uh, reached approximately uh, 20 stories, 25 stories. It's moving at about one floor per week. And uh, the idea here was that this was envisioned as the center of a large tract of land that's controlled by the JEC and uh, is in the process of being uh, master planned um, it has gone through a series of master plans, but it's now being master planned and linked into the city with road systems and uh, even with potential and anticipated uh, transit links uh, either inside the complex or possibly in the future stretching out from that. But uh, it's a shoe-like or boot-like shape, and we're the red dot in the center. 
Um, and we've gone through a series of early plans. This was one where the tower had a shopping center adjacent to it and um, a series of about 15 or 16 um, residential office and hotel buildings uh, in a, a setting that uh, began to uh, both view towards Kingdom Tower and generate uh, economic value for the developers around the site. And this is the small section of that development. Um, the Kingdom Tower itself has, um, it has office space, it has uh, hotel, it has residential, uh, and it has uh, an observation deck at the very top of the occupied space, which you can see uh, is located now where the where the outside terrace is. We used to call this the helipad. <laughs> um, the, um, you can see how the building is uh, sitting in next to uh, water, and water was at this time uh, an important feature in terms of the landscape uh, for generation of additional valued pieces of land on the water. Uh, that's now since uh, changed a little bit, but not too much. And uh, the idea of promenades around the tower, connecting the public space near grade up into the layers of the uh, drop-offs that um, will, will be the entry points for the three major functions of office, hotel, and residential. Uh, the um, the um, observation deck is actually approached through the shopping center so that you take advantage of the people flow through to and from the, the observation deck. And these canopies, these large areas, begin to help to link the tower to the ground, give it a sense of human scale, and um, you still have the awesome aspect of height and view and perspective as you look up, but the canopies just help to mitigate that and give it a sense of a, a zone that you, uh, the human can feel comfortable in. And then when you're up here, uh, the sky is the limit, and it is going to be a fantastic uh, place to be. I don't know any place like that in the world. And. Uh, we also have glass bottom floors, so you can be on those glass floors looking down uh, if you're so bold to get on those. And uh, that better? so that's the thrill and the exhilaration of these kinds of, of facilities. And there it is from the top. Uh, the building will be over one kilometer tall, and uh, I am sure that from from that observation deck, you'll be able to look out and see the clouds uh, from time to time, uh, just as you do at uh, Burj Khalifa, which is quite in interesting when you're seeing the shadow of Burj Khalifa spreading out over a mile over the clouds. It's, it's uh, pretty cool. Um, so how do you take these things that we've learned over the last 20 years, 25 years, in terms of development in terms of the role of the high-rise uh, in the developed scenario, and how do we take it beyond um, the point that we're at now? Um, we were commissioned about four years ago to look at um, a prototype city called uh, Great Cities by a, a Chinese firm called Bantone. And they had uh, first hired us to do the prototype on a one square kilometer site. They had envisioned uh, a city like a satellite city that could be placed around the edges of the major mega cities in China, like Beijing and Guangzhou, Chengdu. You can name a you can name a hundred of them, uh, and that these compact city centers would have their own means of transit from that location to other major components of the city, but they were envisioned as basically a live-work city where you could live there and you could work there and you could walk anywhere within that city because it's 
smaller than a square mile. Uh, this happened to be the first site that they had found uh, just outside of Chengdu. And uh, we developed a city that goes through a series of goals here, which I don't have time to really read to you. But um, uh, we had analyzed the site. We, first of all, we had the, the prototype, and we then applied the prototype to this city. But it didn't work exactly the way the contours and the topography of the city work. So we started to uh, modify the master plan but keep the basic intent going. And we ended up with uh, a more or less circular city, which gave us a diameter of one mile. So it's still small enough to walk from any one point to any other point in about 10 minutes. The, the, one of the advantages here is that it greatly reduces the need for parking and cars access to any place from there. So. Uh, back to the bicycle and uh, went through a whole series of planning studies to get to there. But one of the, one of the uh, things that was interesting that we tried here that we hadn't done before was to uh, apply the ability to analyze master plans from, a, from the whole district in terms of uh, solar impact and wind impact and to be able to adjust buildings and to adjust streets to get the right amount of, of solar um, time frame, I mean, two hour, three hour, four hour time frames within the public spaces and to give the proper amount of shading as well. So this whole series of street conditions and different orientations that we looked at. And uh, we could model this, uh, this whole city at one time begin to see where our issues were, where our problems were with, with wind movement uh, through the city. We wanted, this was seen as a not, a, not an expensive city, but a middle class Chinese city in terms of uh, affordability. And we wanted to have all levels. There were about 40% of these people would be employed in this, this area. There would be children, there would be grandparents, there would be the entire mix. And uh, that mix would uh, also have access to all services from public schools to fire departments to uh, medical needs to commercial uh, needs to shopping. And uh, you can see here that the variety of architecture begins to be one where you have all different typologies within uh, this, this very densely packed one kilometer city, which creates shopping opportunities here, recreation opportunities, housing, housing types of things. So my 25 minutes is almost up, so thank you very much.